Over three months of dramatic public protests have electrified Hong Kong. What began as opposition to an extradition law has evolved into a broader pro-democracy movement. So why did this crisis develop and where yet might it lead? In the first of two special reports, this is the story behind Hong Kong's Summer of Defiance. from its worst political crisis in decades. Massive protests. Radical action. Streets engulfed in tear gas. So if this standoff uh, persists, it, it's going to end ugly. The movement started in response to the government's plans to amend Hong Kong's extradition law. It was feared anyone suspected of breaking the law could be sent to mainland China to face trial. Outraged Hong Kongers took to the streets, believing such a move would undermine their judiciary and the city's autonomy. Under public pressure, the proposal was put on hold. But the protests didn't stop, and the Chinese government appeared to be losing patience. So what was fueling the demonstrations? And where would they lead? In the first of two reports, People and Power traces the evolution of Hong Kong's Summer of Defiance. June the 9th was when the first major protests kicked off. Anger over the proposed extradition bill had been simmering for weeks. Among other things, Hong Kongers feared Beijing would use the law against its opponents living in or even just passing through the city. From our experience, we knew that if we give unnecessary power to the government, the Hong Kong government will certainly abuse it, the China government will certainly abuse it. Organizers said a million people were on the streets that day. Police had a far more conservative estimate of 240,000. But despite the turnout, Chief Executive Carrie Lam announced the same evening that a second reading of the bill would go ahead anyway. A discussion erupted on social media and in various chat groups. Actually, they all is asking a question, what should we do if peaceful march is useless? They think that uh, maybe we should go radical, maybe there is something we still can do and the government may hurt us. A group of protesters decided to head for the entrance of the Legislative Council building. Some attempted to breach police lines. By the time Jason arrived, clashes had erupted. I was pulled down by the police, and so I grabbed my friend's legs and they beat me. I was like, uh, half of unconsciousness, so uh, they dragged me through the metal barrier and they throw me there and they uh, zip me up uh, for like three to four hours after. Jason faces a five-year sentence for unlawful assembly. He says he has no regrets. A way to use whatever he can to uh, let the government hear our voice, even though they may not care, even though uh, it is turned out nothing, but we need to do this out. Uh, 
our odds, our duty. Jason's college roommate was also arrested the same night. A philosophy major, Tai On has weighed the pros and cons of radical action. Like many of their peers, both Jason and Tai On took part in the Umbrella Movement in 2014. For 79 days, hundreds of thousands of Hong Kongers occupied key roads in a largely peaceful show of civil disobedience. But their campaign for universal suffrage ended without any concessions from the government, and many of the movement's leaders were jailed. Today, protesters say they've learned from the past. Five years after the umbrella movement, roads surrounding government headquarters were once again filled with protesters. It was the 12th of June, three days after the first major march. A second reading of the extradition bill was scheduled to take place that morning. Protesters were surrounding the government complex to stop the Legislative Council from meeting. The vast majority of people who showed up were peaceful. But some believed more needed to be done to make the government listen. Late morning, opposition lawmaker Alvin Young received some news. But it wasn't what the protesters wanted, and they refused to back down. Hoping to calm things down, Young approached the police. It was yet another sign of how much things had changed since the Umbrella Movement. No one person or group was in charge. No one could tell these protesters what to do. Away from the front line, the protest remained peaceful. Up on a bridge, filmmaker Ying Liang and a group of academics and artists were on a hunger strike. Originally from mainland China, he now lives in exile in Hong Kong after making a film critical of the mainland's justice system. If enacted, the extradition law could be used on him. By late afternoon, some protesters on the front lines were getting restless. Outside the main entrance of the Legislative Council building, demonstrators charged police lines. Police responded. 
with rubber bullets and then tear gas, driving all protesters in the area, including those not involved in clashes, towards the entrance of a nearby building. Footage shared on social media shows a near stampede as, hemmed in on three sides by police, hundreds of protesters attempted to flee through the one unlocked door of this office building. Outside, police continued to fire tear gas right into the middle of the fleeing crowd. In another video, riot police were seen grabbing hold of and beating this man. By nightfall, police had pushed protesters away from the area surrounding government offices. At around the same time, Chief Executive Carrie Lam released this video. It was a characterization with significant legal implications. Anyone charged with rioting faces up to 10 years in prison. It was a sea of black as Hong Kongers returned to the streets on the 16th of July. They marched despite an announcement by Lam that she was suspending debate on the extradition bill indefinitely. Although Carrie Lam has postponed uh, the extradition bill, uh, our system do not allow the people or even the pan-democratic legislative councillors to stop the extradition bill from uh, passing. Uh, in fact, in 12 days, the government can uh, restart the extradition bill, can uh, restart the whole legislation process. Placards and signs reflected a growing anger towards the police, who were accused of using excessive force in clearance operations outside government headquarters. adding to the outrage the death of a protester a day earlier. He had been staging a one-person demonstration when he fell from a building. In the weeks that followed, six protesters killed themselves for reasons that may or may not be linked to the movement. Uh, we really don't want to see more suicides happening. We understand that this can be contagious. This is a long campaign. We are with you. Um, do talk to us. Uh, we are here. We will be together with you. Nine days after the first major protest, Chief Executive Carrie Lam told the people of Hong Kong that she was sorry. The concerns over the past few months have been caused by deficiencies in the work of the SAR government over the amendment exercise. This has led to controversies, disputes, and anxieties in society. For this, I offer my most sincere apology to all people of Hong Kong. It is uh, very unlikely. Uh, For these protesters, it wasn't enough. They also wanted Lam to stop categorizing the June 12th protest as a riot and to set up an independent inquiry into alleged police brutality. But Lam wasn't budging. Police, for their part, insisted their actions were necessary and proportionate. My officers are acting in accordance with our guidelines, and they rightfully use the force to protect themselves and other people at the scene. 
protesters responded with increasingly radical action. Police headquarters were surrounded and besieged multiple times. Their entrances blocked, buildings vandalized. It was an embarrassment for a force once known as Asia's finest. Pro-Beijing lawmaker Michael Tian believes Lam should shoulder much of the blame. All this was started by the chief executive herself. She made a political decision. It backfired. She is the only one that can resolve it. Putting the police in between really is unfair to the police. What's made things worse for the police are the new tactics employed by protesters. They've taken pains to hide their identities and have no known leaders. Most of the organizing is conducted online. Most Hong Kong people, they use an online forum called LIHKG. And a lot of mobilization actually originates from, from, from that forum itself. And then they move to Telegram and anyone can speak. I didn't follow all the messages because messages could be overflowing like crazy with over a thousand in say 10 to 15 minutes. The approach can generate a lot of noise, but also plenty of ideas. Ahead of the G20 summit, a series of advertisements calling for international support for the movement appeared in major newspapers across the world. Strikingly, there was now a fifth demand for universal suffrage or free and fair elections for the city's chief executive and for all its lawmakers. The project was run by volunteers, many of whom had never met each other. We start the crowdfunding on 25th of June, which is a Tuesday, and then within eight hours, 6.7 million were collected. And everything was just like boom, 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 like that. And then within two days, even the newspaper were published. At around the same time, a different group decided to organize a march. At each stop, protesters urged G20 nations to raise the issue of Hong Kong during the summit in Osaka. Protesters said both this and the advertising campaign evolved separately and organically, in line with a philosophy embraced by many in the movement. Be water, a saying popularized by Hong Kong screen legend Bruce Lee, meaning to be adaptable and to go with the flow. That also means nothing about the movement is predictable, as the events of the 1st of July were to show. It was the 22nd anniversary of Hong Kong's handover to China. And for the first time ever, the ceremony was taking place indoors. Outside, three meter high barriers surrounded the venue. In various chat groups, there had been calls for protesters to disrupt the ceremony. Police weren't taking any chances. But they didn't see this coming. Unable to get past police lines, protesters turned their attention towards a different target, the Legislative Council building. Several pro-democracy lawmakers arrived soon after, warning of severe legal consequences. (laughs) 
On the other side of the glass panels, dozens of armed police looked on. The break-in happened as hundreds of thousands of Hong Kongers marched peacefully at the annual July 1st rally. Along the way, they were greeted by these protesters. Many heeded the call, although few went to the front line. Instead, they showed their support in other ways. Human chains passed on supplies to those trying to break in. At around 9 p.m., the first group of protesters were finally entering the Legislative Council. Police were nowhere to be seen. A protester defaced the emblem of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. Others draped the city's colonial-era flag on the speaker's podium. Another tore up a copy of Hong Kong's constitution, the Basic Law. But perhaps the person who made the boldest move was this young man. Brian Leung, a PhD student based in the US, left Hong Kong shortly after this extraordinary night. We managed to speak to him on the phone. The Legislative Council has been a very undemocratic system. Right? It symbolized the very undemocratic politics and the deprivation of our freedom over the past few years. The moment you step into the Legislative Chamber, there's no turning back. And it's going to be a now or never moment that we have to join forces together and do something. <laughs> They agreed to release a statement reiterating their demands. But the call to occupy the chamber didn't draw much support. Despite knowing the risks, Rex was one of a handful of protesters who decided to remain. But some of their fellow protesters had other ideas. There 正正是因為他們這個一個都不放棄的行動,而令到民意沒有逆轉。其實他真的救了我們。Outside, police moved in with tear gas. But by then, most of the protesters were gone. At 4 a.m. that morning, the chief executive called a press conference. I hope the community at large will agree with us that with these violent acts that we have seen, it is right for us to condemn it and hope society will return to normal as soon as possible. We have faith in our young people. Let us continue to walk with them. But the public condemnation didn't quite materialize. 
For Hong Kong's protesters, the fight was far from over. Next week on People and Power, questions and recriminations after suspected triad members attacked protesters and commuters at a train station. And then a climb down. The government will formally withdraw the bill in order to fully allay public concerns. But would it be enough? <laughs>